Hi, everybody. This is Philip Martin. This is uh, On Film, On Video. It's February 25th, 2022. We've got uh, Cyrano opening this week, and Cyrano is um, possibly the best movie musical of last year. I mean, I haven't seen West Side Story yet. Still haven't seen it. But uh, Cyrano is pretty good, and it is... Um, it's it's interesting that this film didn't get a whole lot of um, awards recognition. I haven't heard a whole lot of buzz about it except in the trades and among fellow movie critics and people like that. Uh, I I would think it would be one of the you know first big movies of the year, though we may have already. I mean it's February. I mean it's not like uh, anybody is going to remember this. Come, that, that's the siren. The siren's going off. So you know exactly what time it is. We're actually people of the future. We're actually back on the past. We're back on um, Wednesday at noon. So therefore you get the noon siren and all this attendant noise. And if you can't hear it, well, you know, trust me, there's a siren going off. It's winding now. Okay. Anyway, uh, last night, I mean, we were having a great time lately. Um, I've been, I've been on a roll. We watched um, my Friday class. We watched um, the Le Grand Illusion Renoir's uh, film from 1937 last week. And I wrote about it for my Tuesday column, or I wrote about Renoir a little bit. And I think this Friday, what I'm planning, I still haven't, what I'm planning on showing probably right now is your, if you're, reading this or listening to this on uh, Friday morning. Now, I'll probably be in class showing uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour, which is one of my favorite films. So Grand Illusion is also one of my favorite films. I almost forgot how much I liked that movie, uh, re-watching it. And last night, uh, we watched uh, Claude Charbot's uh, Madame Bovary. So I'm in this really, you know, kind of this French film sort of, um, you know, Phase. I'm really enjoying going back and looking at all these films. Uh, Isabel Hubert in um, Bovary is just just spellbinding. He's just fine. And you know, and I realize that this kind of puts me in a different place than most moviegoers. Most moviegoers who, you know, like see maybe ten movies in a theater a year. I don't even think they do that anymore. I think it's more like people will see four or five. And in the age of COVID. You know, it's likely to be even less than that. So, what we were, um, the, the, the thing I have to confront is, does, you know, having sort of an elevated taste, does, does that make you a, a snob? And I, I don't think so. I, I really don't, because I think it's, it's um, sort of a function of, Yes, A, education, and B, just sort of taste. I mean, and sort of, and, and, and when I talk about a rarefied taste, I'm not really talking about anything more than the fact that I have seen a lot of movies. I've seen more movies probably than you. Not all of you, because some of you are freaks, but most of you people have not seen as many movies as me, and that's okay. You've done other valuable things with your life, you know, but I have had years where I've seen, you know, 300 movies or so, um, in a, you know, in a year, I've written about 300 movies in a year, so I know I've seen that many in a year, uh, I've watched a lot of films just because I wanted to go back and see them to fill in gaps in my education, now, I would think this is something that every movie critic would do at some point or another that would that you would you know try to learn about uh, you know different eras of film there's film history is not that long i mean it's barely you know more than 100 years 120 well, the, the luminaire brothers from uh, 1895 i think and then you uh, take it from there so we can say it's like to 130 years okay we have 130 years of film that's not a whole lot to learn about but still there are a lot of films released every year and there's still gaps in my education that i'm not um i mean i'm just never going to fill in all of, i'm not, not going to caulk it all in that's true 
Uh, I'm always going to be pretty weak on silent films. I'm always going to be uh, rather weak on screwball comedies of the 30s compared to some of my peers. I know the 70s films really well. I, if 70s on, I'm really good. 60s films, I'm pretty good at. And I'm sort of, you know, I, I, I'm going back and hitting high spots and learning all about this. You don't need to do that. The movies don't exist to be studied. You know, they really don't. They exist to be enjoyed. They exist to entertain. They exist to sell popcorn. If you really want to come down to it, to get you in a theater and to spend some money and to make these people rich. So, it's kind of ridiculous for me to feel superior to somebody just because I have an elevated taste in movies. It's impossible, though. This is Thackeray. I wrote it in a book called The Book of Snobs. It is impossible in our condition of society not to sometimes be a snob. Because it's the way we distinguish ourselves from others. It's, it's, it's just how we stand out. It's how we present ourselves. It's our brand. Snobbery is cheap. All it requires is to have a little specialized knowledge, a little maybe pretension to that specialized knowledge. I've seen people who don't know much pretend they know a lot. And you've, we've all seen the guy who takes the wine list and studies it. And, you know, you can tell he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, that's being a snob. That's worse than being somebody who actually knows about wine and lords it over, you know, his table mates or whatever. Uh I think to be a snob, you have to behave badly. I think just having this knowledge, just having this Epicurean sense of and refinement of taste, you know, I think that's a good thing. What makes you a snob is those little snap judgments that, you know, that you, the way you uh, relate to other people, that's, uh, you know, we make assessments. You know, we base on... Look, on the clothes people wear, I'm wearing a Carhartt sweatshirt, and I've got a sweatshirt on underneath it, and my computer is dinging again. I have no idea why. Okay, it's I know why, and I'm good to you, Danny Joe Crawford. I will accept your call after I get off the air. How about that? So, let's just... Okay, that was Danny Joe Crawford. He wanted to talk about his Legends of Radio... Uh, show that's coming up to benefit uh, Central Arkansas Library System <laughs> next Saturday, uh, March 5th. Guys, if you want me to do something about something, give me more than a week's lead time, okay? I'm a busy person. Anyway, anyway well, welcome back. You just saw the very first ever cut that we've made in one of these on-film things, and uh, we'll be doing more of that because I actually know how to do it, and we're going to start doing these. I'm going to start doing these on Saturday, doing on the weekend, and have more time. I'm not going to do it this week, but I promise in the future I'll actually have some clips and things like that in there, and it will look more like a real kind of video production. It won't just be me talking into the microphone about being a snob, which, as I said... Just being a connoisseur or <laughs> having an elevated appreciation for things does not make you a snob. What makes you a snob is thinking that that makes you better than somebody or, or, or using it as a, you know, a bludgeon to, you know, make fun of somebody. Like, like I've, I've, I've seen this with, with wine a lot, you know, where you probably don't even know that much about it, but you insist on, you know, making other people feel kind of weird, strange. Anyway, the thing that I want to put out there about the movies, though, is it's like, there are a lot of critics like me who really came, come at it from a different point of view than the filmmaking community does. And I mean, I'm trying constantly to, you know, catch up and learn about this stuff. But I'm not a filmmaker, as anybody who watches these things can, can see. Uh, 
I'm much more comfortable uh, with text, with the with the written word. Uh, that's where I come from. I mean, and when I'm writing about, you know, movies or or music, you know, that's I have to be careful not to 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 focus too much upon that part of it because it's not just dialogue and writing and plot and all that. It's making a movie is there's a thousand different, you know, things that are going on and the director really it's as I've said before it's it's not really a uh a artist type job. It's not really the, the the idea of auteur theory, where you're the author of the film, and Jean Renault was probably the very first um, director who thought of himself as an auteur. Um, you're commanding people. You're you're you are a more general contractor. You've got to get you know, and you've got necessarily to make compromises, and nothing is ever going to completely uh, match the vision you hold of the film in your head because you can't get the actor that looks the same way or the right way. You can't get all the practical things to come together in exactly the right way. You have to make compromises. You have to, and sometimes that's great because you have people who are better at realizing these things than you ever could be and add things to it. A good cinematographer, yeah, a great actor, they add things to the whole mix that uh, you couldn't have foreseen and you couldn't have even asked for, you know. Uh, the th- and, and we're talking, and then we go back and we translate, and we're talking about this stuff in, again, language, which is inadequate. There's no comfortable way to write about the feel of a movie the same way as there's no comfortable way to write about the sound of a pop song. Language is inadequate. It's like trying to capture a house on paper. You can go so far, but drawing a house is just drawing a house. It's not the house itself. And making, describing an experience, you can do that more or less successfully, but you can never do it completely, you know. Um, When you're, music, most critics who write about pop music these days aren't really writing about the music so much because they don't have that uh, they don't have the language they don't have the vocabulary they don't possibly don't have the training I mean quite a few of them do quite a few of them you know like I play a little bit and I can um, you know fake it a little bit but I'm not really a musician you know Um, so I'm much more comfortable dealing with the things that surround like a pop song or a movie than the actual thing that's going on. I don't have the the grammar. I'm, I'm not uh, like someone like Paul Schrader who has made movies and is deeply involved in movies and has I think I see, still see movies as like, you know, realizations of other realizations of novels basically, or um it's it's interesting because I think it keeps you humble. I think it's good to understand that you don't understand and that this is a mysterious, you know, sort of alchemy that these, these people are doing. At the same time, I think you can get really, really good at writing about the movies. And writing about the movies is different than making movies. And it is a, uh, when it's done well, when it's done as bad, it's it's an art form on itself. I mean, writing about anything. The way I approach it all is that it's, uh, all this stuff is just an occasion to write anyway. Or to talk on the video thing (laughs) about this stuff. Because it's it's interesting to me, because our real subject is life its own self, as Dan Jenkins would say. It's what we, it's what human beings, you know, the ways in which human beings court affection and, you know, live their lives. That's our subject. And that's Jean Renault's subject as well as mine. 
You know, we're just doing it two different ways. He's making movies, and I'm writing about his movies, but we're both really, I hope, doing something larger than that. You know, I mean, sort of like his movies are not about, uh, Le Grand Illusion is not about uh, prisoners in a prison camp in, in World War One trying to escape. It's about the death of the aristocracy. It's about the coming, leveling age where um, the good thing is is that where maybe the meritocracy you know uh, has more to play with the way with the fate of men but they've also got those uh, you know gathering clouds there and the whole idea about whether a country is a thing or not I'm brought back to the uh, the line in uh, the North Sea that I um, alluded to last week in my column, the law is just what certain men prefer. Well, if you think about it, that's what our society is. Our society is just what certain men prefer. That's why we have national borders. That's why we have um, governments. That's why we have all this. And, and Renoir was, was an interesting guy because he was born to privilege. He was born a... Um, Son of a great artist, son of a genius, son of a guy who got his work hung in the Louvre while he was still alive, which doesn't generally happen. So you've got son of a genius and uh, a remote father who wouldn't let him cut his hair until he was, well, some say 16, but until he went to school. Uh, because he liked painting that long auburn hair that Jean had that uh, was weather alert. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, made him look like a girl in all those paintings, okay? So you've got this child of the aristocracy with this remote father who he really didn't get to know until he was a grown man. We, after he went off to war and got wounded, that's when he really learned it. That's when he really, you know, became buddies with his dad, when he became, because that he had time to sit with his dad and talk with him, and he would go to the movies with his uh, brother, his older brother, they'd see Chaplin, they saw Buster Keaton, they'd see, you know, and that's where Jean Renoir got his film education. Now, now the film history that he was absorbing wasn't very old at all. It's like, you know, I'm talking about 130 years of film history. He had about 15, 19 years of it. Uh, he was born before the movies were born. He was born in 1894. Luminaire Brothers came out in 1895. So, you know, he's living it He's as, as he goes along. And all these ch changes and these technological innovations, you know, are going to be laid out ahead of him because he made films until the 60s. This you know. is a very interesting character, and I'm probably not doing a good job of describing here because... He's really just a tangent to, to what I'm talking about. But, you know, knowing about Jean Renoir helps me be a critic, not because uh, his biography has that much to do with his films. I think you can actually, you know, talk about the art without knowing anything about the artist. But sometimes knowing the artist and knowing his history, knowing the times... Knowing the context of the art is also important. And I feel like I'm losing people, but it's simple. The, the whole thing is simple. It's like you can dig as deep as you want. And it's great because the more you dig, the more you know, the more you're rewarded. It's not like... It's not an onerous thing. On the other hand, if you don't want to do that, if you have other things in which you want to invest your time and your energy, that's fine. Because the movies are, as I've said, entertainment. They are frivolous things. But the great joy that we have is that we can look into these frivolous things and we can lose ourselves in them. We can invest so much in something that means so little. That's the great appeal of sports. It doesn't mean anything, but you can believe 
in your team. You can, you know, you can be a fan. You can be a fan of the movies too. What I don't like is the presumption that one of these things is inherently better than the other because, you know, it's, it's, it's your enthusiasm. You know, your enthusiasm may or may not be uh, interesting to me, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's not interesting to you. And it's not like I'm saying everything is equal, it's all relative and all that. What I'm saying is there are a lot of smart people in the world who don't have time to mess around with the movies. And there are people who spend an inordinate amount of time messing around with the movies. And it's all fine. <laughs> it's just not anything to be proud of, <laughs> if you get my drift. Uh, I, it's classical music, you know, for instance, is really not a dead zone for me, but I don't write about it. I mean, I know a little bit. I listen to it. You know, but I know there are people who can read a score the way I read, like, John Updike. You know, um, God bless them. I, I can't do that. I'm not into that. I don't care that much about hockey either, you know. Uh. <laughs> but when you're talking about the movies, you really have to go further than talking about you know, who the stars are, and even who directed it, and try to get at what it, how it matters. Not so much why it matters, but how it matters. And some movies don't matter at all. Some movies you can just dismiss right out of hand. And it's not because they're the product of uh, laziness or they're they're bad movies, it's because they just don't get you. They just don't make the same sort of um, inroads that others do. And part of that has to do with how you've prepared yourself. I mean, you could watch um, Hiroshima Mount Moore, and if you don't understand any of the historical context, if you don't know about the atomic bomb, if you don't know about World War II, if you don't know about how French collaborators were treated, then, you know, it's probably pretty hard to unpack that movie. Though, uh, René, uh, Alain René, who made the film, I think does a pretty good job if you, you know, if you just watch the film in a vacuum, which is impossible to do, then I think you might get a sense of what he's trying to say anyway. But if you have all these other tools, all these other experiences that you can bring to it, so much better. Anyway, that's the little lecture for today. Remember, Danny Joe Crawford wants you to go see his... Uh, Legends of Radio thing, which is going to be, I guess, at Cal's, uh, at, the, at the Ron Robinson Theater on March 5th. It's got Tommy Smith, uh, Broadway Joe, Craig O'Neill, and Bob Roberts. Yeah, that's right. So all these, these four great radio guys, um, I'm going to have to write something about it because, number one, I'm going to have to write something about it. Just as, it's one of those epic things that you probably ought to to write about. Uh, and I can write about radio because I've done radio and I do radio. And uh, I know all those guys, so they, it's great. Anyway, that's it. Uh, we'll talk to you later.